my name is Laura Stepien, and this is a video lecture about patient monitoring. You can read more about patient monitoring and physical exam items in chapter six of your Elsevier Veterinary Assisting Textbook. So the first question we might want to ask is, why do we want to monitor our patients? So when we have a patient hospitalized, uh, whether they had surgery or they're a sick patient, we do want to check in on them periodically throughout the day. Uh, so when we say that we want them to be monitored regularly, regularly means at least every four hours. It might be more often depending on the status of the animal. If it's an animal that is um, very ill, maybe on the verge of death, we might be monitoring just constantly. Uh, if it's an animal that's fairly stable, every four hours should be good. So the purpose to monitor a patient is to monitor their trends. So we wanna see, are they getting better? or are they getting worse? So uh, we can record um, the findings that we find for the vital signs, et cetera, into the patient's medical file. And the doctor can follow those trends to see, are they improving or are they deteriorating? Um, you might be asking now also, are vet assistants allowed to do patient monitoring? And I would say yes, in conjunction with a vet tech. Uh, I often ask my assistants to help me by taking a quick temperature or uh, a heart rate, et cetera, um, so that I can write those things into the file and have that monitoring done. Especially if there's a large number of hospitalized patients, it really helps to have another team member that is able to uh, do that patient monitoring. And I personally feel like everyone in the hospital should be able to do this so that we are checking in on the patients regularly and can see if anything does start to turn uh, for the worse. Um, as soon as possible. So the first thing that we are going to monitor when we are monitoring our patients is their vital signs. So vital signs are exactly what you might think they are based on the name. They are vital. They are of absolute importance to life. So things like body temperature, the respiratory rate, the heart rate, and indications of perfusion. Uh, so we're going to get into more details of these four vital signs as we go through. There are other items we're going to monitor as well, but we're going to start by discussing the vital signs. So I did include a chart in your course here that looks like this. This is a chart of the normal vital signs for cats and dogs. It is important to know your normal numbers. If you don't know what's normal, how will you recognize what's abnormal? So I do encourage you to memorize this chart. I will also throw the caveat at you that uh, you'll notice in your textbook, if you have a few textbooks, you can look and see if they have reference charts for the vital signs, and they all might be slightly different. Um, as long as you are, you know, in the general area, they're not going to be all like really vastly different. Like you're not going to see a normal temperature being 37 and a half to 39 or like 85 to 86. They're not going to be that different. You might see like 37.3 to 39.4. So sometimes there's just little changes um, in vital signs. This is the chart I'm going to ask you to memorize for your test purposes. Okay, this is the chart that we are going to all agree now is the normals for cats and dogs. You might see different charts elsewhere, but this is the one that I'm going to mark you on for your tests. So do know your normals. So first up is body temperature. We have two options for taking a body temperature in a cat and dog. We can do an ear temperature uh, with the little ear monitors. Those are fairly non-invasive. Um, as long as the patient is okay with having their ears handled, it's usually pretty easy to take their temperature with the ear. Um, that being said, ear thermometers are not as accurate. A rectal temperature is going to be the most accurate temperature. And if we do have a sick patient, that is the temperature that we are going to want to take and record. Um, so a rectal temperature, this thermometer here is uh, that's shown here is a rectal thermometer. Uh, it's just lubed up and then inserted into the anus until it starts to beep. And then you know that that is the correct temperature. Uh, so the normal for cats and dogs is slightly different. Dogs are a little bit cooler than cats at 37 and a half to 39 degrees Celsius and normals for cats is 38 degrees to 39 and a half degrees Celsius. So a little bit warmer uh, than dogs for the normal for cats. Now, if we do have a patient that is below uh, the normal temperature, that means that they are hypothermic. So uh, they have a reduced body temperature. 
So if we do have a hypothermic patient, we do want to actively warm them to 37 degrees Celsius. In order to actively warm an animal, we can use things like a circulating warm water blanket, uh, forced warm air devices, that's something like the hot dog. We can use warm water bottles or warm towels and blankets fresh from the dryer. We can use straight up a hair dryer, or a blow dryer. If we have heat lamps, an incubator, those are all going to be good things. We can also warm IV fluids and have warm fluids going into their IV catheter. This can help in two ways. One, we're just providing more heat. And two, it also increases the blood perfusion. Um, and that will also increase that core body temperature. We need to be careful if we aren't using a device that is uh, like a monitor device. So things like a warm water blanket or a forced warm air device, those are good to go. But if you're using something like a water bottle or warm towels and blankets, those things can lose heat with time. And uh, the colder they get, the more heat they're actually going to pull from the patient. So if we are using something like, you know, a microwavable oat bag or a warm water bottles, we do need to check in on those things frequently to make sure that they're not uh, inadvertently cooling the patient. We also absolutely do not want to use electric heat blankets or like heating pads. Um, those things can be, uh, they definitely run the risk of overheating. It is possible to burn our patients and it is possible since they're electric to um, shock our patients as well, which we obviously don't want. Now, if we have a hyperthermic patient, that is a patient that is too hot, their body temperature is too high, those patients can be actively cooled until they reach 39 and a half degrees Celsius. So we can cool our patients IV fluids that are room temperature will help to decrease that, uh, that body temperature. Uh, we can give them oxygen therapy, especially if we do blow by oxygen therapy, that cool oxygen coming in is going to help to cool down the body. We can use cool and or wet towels and blankets to help them cool down. Uh, we can put them into a cool bath. You'll notice none of these say cold. We don't want to shock their bodies. We're just going to use cool water if we're going to be using those things to help cool them down. Uh, we can provide for them some cool drinking water. Uh, we can have fans or the AC blowing on them. And we can also put alcohol on their toe pads. So alcohol has a very high uh, evaporation rate. So um, if we put them on the toe pads, it's going to evaporate and take with it some of the heat from the animal as well. If you are going to use that method, we need to make sure that they're not licking at their feet because that's going to uh, give them an upset tummy if they're licking all that alcohol. And when I say alcohol, of course I'm meaning 70% isopropyl alcohol like you'll find in the vet clinic. I don't mean open a bottle of vodka, okay? So uh, be careful with that one. We want to use isopropyl alcohol. Um, if an animal is at home and they have become hyperthermic, this is very common in our Canadian summers can get very hot. Uh, we would like to instruct the owner to spray the animal down with some cool water and then just drive to the clinic as soon as you can with their car AC on high or I guess windows open if you don't have AC in your car. Uh, so hyperthermia, sorry, just to go back to that, hyperthermia and hypothermia, I would consider both of them uh, emergency situations and they should be uh, treated in clinic. Um, so after we've checked body temperature, when we're monitoring vital signs, we want to check respiration as well. Um, so actually, I, I kind of spoke wrong there. What we should be doing is monitoring respiration first uh, before we do body temperature. So the best time to assess respiration is before we've done any kind of restraint or any manipulation, i.e. taking a rectal temperature, uh, because those things can get the animal a little bit fired up. So technically, even though body temperature is listed first, I usually do that one last, just because it's the most invasive. I usually observe the animal for respiration first, then I take a heart rate, which is our next thing that we'll talk about, and then I do the body temperature and signs of perfusion. So first thing I like to do is check that respiration. Um, I can take a respiration rate by observing the animal. So I just need to look at the animal at this point. I'm going to watch that chest rise and fall as they're breathing. And I'm going to count how many breaths that that animal takes in 15 seconds. Um, after 15 seconds is up, I'm going to take that number and multiply it by four. Because when we're recording a respiration rate, we're going to record it as breaths per minute. Um, so if we count for 15 seconds, uh, four times 15 is 60 seconds, which is a minute. 
So for a normal dog, uh, the, uh, the normal respiration rate is going to be between 15 and 30 breaths per minute. For a normal cat, usually between 20 and 30. Um, if cats are panting or open mouth breathing, uh, we're definitely concerned about that. That would not be normal. Dogs panting, however, depending on the situation might just be normal. Uh, so we would record panting. I'm not gonna try to count um, the how many pants they do in one minute. We also wanna check their uh, rhythm of breathing and the effort. So uh, we have a few different terms here to know. So bradypnea is slow breathing. So if they're not breathing very quickly, it's below normal, they're suffering from bradypnea. Uh, tachypnea, that means that they're breathing really rapidly. Um, so tachypnea tends to be a rapid shallow breathing. So like a <laughs> kind of panting. Hyperpnea is different. Hyperpnea is normal after exercise. So think about like after you've gone for a run or if you've, you know, carried something really heavy or wrestled with a big dog, uh, you're probably going to be breathing deeper and faster. So that's that kind of like, <sighs> so that's normal after exercise might be normal for a patient that's really excited to be in the clinic, but really, really fast and rapid breathing <clears throat> uh, tachypnea, that isn't normal, and we would record that in the file. We could also record dyspnea. Dyspnea is when the animal is having difficulty breathing. Uh, so maybe they're kind of like gasping for air, or they're really putting a lot of effort into their breathing. Uh, we would record that as dyspnea. And then uh, lastly, we have agonal breathing. So agonal breathing is really labored breathing. It's not just like a difficulty, they're really working hard to get that oxygen in. They tend to be gasping. Often agonal breathing we see right before a patient passes away. So it is um, a, an emergency situation if we do see agonal breathing. We can also listen to respiratory sounds. Um, you, normal respiration shouldn't be noisy. So if you see any of these uh, abnormal respiratory sounds, we would wanna report that immediately to the doctor and record it in the file. Uh, so if we hear any harsh or staticky sounds when they're breathing, crackles or popping sounds, wheezing, or like if it almost sounds like they're like humming, a musical sound. Um, if we hear any upper airway sounds, so things like snoring, Although again, that can be normal depending on the patient's uh, configuration, right? If you have a, a brachycephalic dog, one of those squishy face dogs, like a pug, often they're making uh, a lot of a noise just by breathing and existing. So it might be uh, like normal for the specific animal um, to have those upper airway sounds like snoring. Uh, muffled or absent sounds, if we don't hear, uh, if we don't see or hear any breathing, we're concerned about that, obviously. Uh, and if there's really noisy breathing, it's called inspiratory strider. Um, so if the, if the no breathing is really noisy, then we want to report that as well. So after we've ha had a look at the animal's respiration, we want to check in on that heart. So first things first, let's define a term here. So auscultation. Auscultation means listening to the sounds that the body makes. Uh, so typically the sounds the body makes, it makes heart sounds, there's lung sounds, and there's gut sounds. And all of those sounds can be assessed with a stethoscope. So uh, we are going to auscultate the heart to listen to the heart. Uh, we can also auscultate the lungs to listen for any of those weird sounds we just talked about. So when we are auscultating the heart to take a heart rate, we're going to use that stethoscope. We're going to place it, uh, usually the left side of the heart, or sorry, the left side of the chest is going to have better and clearer heart sounds for you to find uh, because the heart is on the left side of the chest. So it just makes sense that it'll be easier to hear on the closer side. Um, so you're gonna place the stethoscope over the chest there and you're going to listen to the heart rate or you can palpate a pulse. So palpate, remember, means to feel. We can use our fingers to feel for a pulse. And I'll speak to that in just a few minutes. Uh, either way, uh, we're going to count how many heartbeats we hear or feel. And we're going to count those for 15 seconds, just like respiration. And then we're going to multiply that number by four to get our beats per minute. So for a normal small dog, their resting heart rate is going to be between 90 and 140 beats per minute. 
Um, they're, if there's a normal large dog, their resting heart rate is going to be between 60 and 100 beats per minute. Cats at rest are usually between 130 and 190 beats per minute. Cats, however, at the vet clinic tend to be extremely stressed. So we'll see those heart rates as high as 220 beats per minute. Uh, anything above and beyond that, I'm going to be very concerned about. Uh, but often we do see up to 220 with no concern for, the, for that animal. Um, so after we've listened or felt for the heart rate, we can uh, observe the rhythm of the heart. So we have a few, um, a few rhythms we can talk about here. So bradycardia is a slow heart rate. So anything that's below that normal, we would talk about bradycardia. Tachycardia means fast. So a fast heart rate um, is anything above those normals. We could also see arrhythmias. Arrhythmias are any abnormal heart rhythm. And arrhythmias do include brady and tachycardias. Uh, since those rhythms are slower or faster than normal, those are included in the category of arrhythmia. Arrhythmias can also just be erratic beats that aren't um, aren't regular at all. So if it's like boop, 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 if it's all kind of all over the place, that would be an arrhythmia. There is though one type of normal arrhythmia that we do often see, especially in dogs, and it's called a sinus arrhythmia. This is actually a, like I said, a normal arrhythmia. What happens is when the animal's breathing in, the heart rate goes a little bit faster and then it slows down during expiration and then speeds up for inhalation and it slows down for exhalation. Uh, so that is a normal occurrence when you do hear that. Um, I'll usually bring it to the attention, like if I was a vet assistant, I would bring it to the attention of the tech. Uh, but if it's a normal sinus arrhythmia, then we aren't concerned about that for the animal. Um, and then uh, we also want to listen for heart sounds. So the heart does usually make a lub-dub sound. Lub-dub counts as one heartbeat. Uh, so when you're listening with the stethoscope, the heart sound lub-dub, 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 that's normal, though each one is one beat. If we're talking um, about a murmur, we're gonna hear kind of a kind of sound. What's happening with a murmur is those valves in the heart that open to let blood through and then close to make sure it doesn't backflow they're not functioning properly and they're letting blood flow back. And that's why we hear that whoosh kind of sound because it's the fluid blood moving through those uh, valves when they shouldn't. Heart murmurs can range between very, very quiet and difficult to hear to so prominent you can actually feel the heart murmur on the outside of the body. So when you touch it, it's called a palpable thrill and it feels funny under your hands. Um, so if you do notice any kind of weird sounds, if you're using a stethoscope and listening to the heart, bring those attention, bring those to the attention of the vet tech or the veterinarian so they can have a listen and, um, and take whatever action is needed. So if you uh, are not able to use a stethoscope, maybe there was, isn't one available or um, I don't know, it's difficult to access the dog's chest. Uh, we might want to palpate a pulse. So the best place to do that on an awake animal is in the femoral artery. So this is right in that inguinal zone. Um, and it's really close uh, um, on the hind leg, really close up to the body wall on the hind leg on the inside. So the medial aspect. Um, so in there, you can feel that pulse. You can use that pulse to count beats for 15 seconds and then multiply those by four to get the beats per minute. Uh, we can also describe the way the pulse feels. Um, so it might be a really weak pulse, difficult to feel. Um, thready means you can't, it's really a sporadic kind of feeling. It might be irregular. So if it isn't a steady heart rate, if they have an irregularity or um, uh, an arrhythmia, uh, it could just feel normal, or it could be bounding, which is really strong and really like bouncy almost, or it could be absent if the animal has, has passed away. Uh, so either way, we can describe the feeling and we can describe uh, the rate by, by reporting a number for the heart. So uh, the last vital sign that we're going to assess is perfusion. You might be asking, what the heck does perfusion mean? Perfusion is a measure of how the blood is passing through the circulatory system to get to the capillaries, 
to get to body tissues. So the heart might be beating, but it might not be beating strong enough to actually get blood into tissues. Um, so perfusion is a way that we can assess that. So uh, there are three different ways that we can assess perfusion. We can assess by blood pressure. We can assess by capillary refill time. We can assess by mucous membrane color. So let's discuss each of those. So blood pressure. Um, you've probably had your blood pressure measured at some point. I think 120 over 80 is the normal for humans. Uh, for pets, it's a little bit different. Um, so for normal cats and dogs, the, the measurement of the systolic blood pressure is 100 to 160 millimeters of mercury. So MMHG stands for millimeters of mercury. Um, the, the systolic blood pressure, when you're talking numbers, so 120 over 80, it, the systolic measure is the top number. Um, so the systolic blood pressure is when the, um, it's, sorry, it's the measure of the pressure in the arteries of the body when the heart is contracting, specifically when the ventricles are contracting. So when blood is being pushed out to the body, that's the systolic blood pressure. The diastolic blood pressure is when the heart is relaxed. So blood isn't being actively pushed in that moment. The diastolic blood pressure is measuring the pressure in the arteries when that heart is relaxing. That's usually the bottom number, so 80. It makes sense that pressure would be higher when we're actively pushing blood through than when blood is um, not being actively pushed through. So the top number is systolic and it's usually a higher number than the diastolic pressure. Um, so systolic is the measure that gives us the most information about the patient. Uh, we are concerned about high numbers of diastolic, but systolic is going to be the more important number. And fortunately for us, we can measure systolic with um, all types of machines. So if we have an electronic blood pressure monitor, so one that looks like this, it does all the inflating of the cuff and the measurement man, or sorry, automatically, um, it will give you a systolic and a diastolic pressure. Um, if, however, you're using a Doppler monitor, it's only going to measure the systolic pressure. Uh, and that's the one that we're most concerned about. So um, good thing. <laughs> so this, oh, this picture shows up kind of blurry, but this is an example of using a Doppler. And this is called a sphygmomanometer. And that's like what creates the pressure for the blood pressure. And then we have a variety of cuff sizes. So when we are placing um, or selecting a cuff for, um, for blood pressure, we need to, first of all, choose a cuff. The width of the cuff is going to be 40% of the circumference of the limb. So you should have a measuring tape, measure where you're going to place the, um, the cuff, and then uh, figure out what 40% of that measurement is and choose that size. So uh, where can we place the cuff? The foreleg? The hind leg, if we're going to use the hind leg, it's above the hock, but below the knee. So kind of in that middle zone there. Or we can also use the base of the tail. My preference always is the hind leg. That I find is the easiest one to get an accurate reading with. When we are taking a blood pressure reading, we do want to make sure that the limb that we're using is level with the heart. So we don't want it up in the air. We don't want it hanging off the table. We want it all level. So capillary refill time, also abbreviated to CRT. What we're measuring here is how quickly the capillaries refill after we pushed blood out of them. So what we're going to do, like in this top picture, is we're going to press on the gums. My favorite place to do it is right over the canine, because you can see we have a really nice visual here. So we're going to push with our finger on those gums. We don't have to push very hard, just enough to turn the gums white. And then we're going to start counting in seconds to see how quickly it turns back to pink. The normal rate of return is going to be two seconds or less. The vast majority of normal healthy animals is going to be immediate. Uh, if it's taking longer than two seconds, we're, uh, we're going to be concerned about that animal and we're going to report that to the vet tech and the veterinarian. We can also measure or monitor our mucous membrane color. So in a normal cat and dog, we want to see nice pink gums like this, nice and healthy. Uh, and now I've got four abnormal versions to show you. So this would be a pale gum. So they look really white. This usually is going to indicate some kind of anemia. Maybe the animal is hemorrhaging. It could also indicate that the animal is hypothermic. So low blood or sorry, low body temperature. It could indicate that they're in pain. 
that uh, they have a decreased cardiac output. So the heart's just not pumping out the blood well enough, or it could mean dehydration. We don't need to uh, make the diagnosis of what's causing it. We just need to recognize the mucous membrane is pale and report that to the doctor. Uh, and then this is an example of cyanotic uh, mucous membranes. So this animal has, uh, you can see the gums and the tongue all kind of have like a blue tinge to them. Anytime we see that blue, it means the animal doesn't have enough oxygen and that they are in respiratory distress or deceased. Uh, and then this one is, uh, you can see the gums look really yellow. Uh, that is called icterus, or we would describe the animal as being icteric. Uh, that yellowness is also called jaundice. It's usually associated with liver disease. It's a buildup of bile in, uh, the, the, in the tissues. And then uh, lastly, we have brick red. So if the gums are not that nice, healthy pink, but like a dark brick red, uh, that can indicate either septicemia, which is like a whole body um, blood infection or shock. Uh, so any of those abnormal colors, we do wanna report to the doctor or the vet tech. So after we've monitored our four vital signs, so temperature, respiration, heart rates, and, um, and perfusion, we're gonna go ahead and also monitor our hospitalized patients for their weights. So we do wanna monitor hospitalized patients daily. Uh, and then patients that aren't hospitalized, we want to weigh them every time they're in. Um, <coughs> pardon me. Measuring patients' weights are going to help us to monitor if they're eating and drinking enough while they're hospitalized. Uh, we can also perform a BCS or a body condition score. Uh, so if an animal is visibly losing weight, we're uh, going to be concerned about that as well. So we do want to weigh patients and then record that in the file. Um, so nutrition, we also want to make sure that we're, we're, we are recording in the file what the animal has been eating while they are in the clinic. Uh, so basically, when we're doing um, a nutritional assessment, we're kind of checking in to see if the animal needs any kind of nutritional support. Um, if they are not eating, we're concerned about malnutrition. So uh, we want to measure the food that we're putting into the bowl when the animal is in the clinic, and we want to report how much they ate. So if I'm giving canned food in the clinic, which is my usual go-to, uh, I can say, let's give them a quarter of a can. And then if they eat about half of that, I would report eight, an eighth of a can of whatever cat food. Um, or if the animal is on a tube, a, a, a feeding tube, or if we're force feeding them, we need to record the volume of food that's given or delivered in that method. We also wanna make sure we're checking in on their hydration status as well. Uh, so we want to record how much water has been drinking by the pet. Um, so again, we're gonna measure how much water we put into the bowl and we can measure how much is left. Uh, and we would want to record if they've received any sub-Q or IV fluids, we want to record how much fluid they received as well in the file. So hydration is usually rated by like the percent lost. Um, so usually the doctor kind of makes that assessment, uh, but a 15% loss of hydration is considered fatal. Uh, a patient that's like 5% dehydrated, you might see like a dry nose, um, their eyes and, or I'm sorry, dry nose, their mouth might be kind of dry and their eyes might look dry. Uh, at about 10%, we start to see sunken eyes. And when we make a skin tint or, you know, kind of grab that scruff area on the back of the cat, the skin doesn't go back down. It kind of stays up as a skin tint. Uh, we'll see that at about 10%. Uh, and at 15% loss, that, that animal will die. It, that it's fatal. So we do want to make sure that our animals are hydrated while they are in the hospital. So we'll, we'll make a note in the file of how much they're drinking and how much fluids they are receiving. When we are recording we, fluids and water drink, we want to make sure we're reporting in how much time. So um, like if they, you're coming in in the morning, you're recording how much IV fluids they received overnight. Uh, if it's been in the last four hours, you know, received 100 mLs in the last four hours. So we've measured, we're monitoring our inputs, so nutrition and um, hydration. We also want to monitor our outputs, so urine, feces, and vomiting. 
So normal urine production in cats is about 20 to 40 mils per kilo per day. I don't expect you to measure urine. Uh, you do not need to uh, try to collect it and uh, find an exact ml amount unless for some reason the doctor requires that information. But normal monitoring, we're just going to record did the animal urinate and approximately how much. We use the subjective uh, one plus, two plus, three plus. So one plus is a small amount, two plus is a normal amount, three plus is a large amount. Uh, so it's kind of subjective, but at least we get kind of an idea of how much urine output they're putting out. Uh, we do want to give all patients that are hospitalized a chance to use the bathroom. So if we do have dogs that are able to walk and are allowed to walk, um, then we would like to take them outside at least every four hours to give them a chance to use the bathroom. Uh, cats, we want to provide them with a litter box. And since they're sleeping right next to it because they're tiny kennels, if you notice that litter box has been used, we need to clean it immediately so that they're not having to sit there with their soiled box. Uh, when we do notice that there has been excretions of any kind, urine, feces, or vomiting, we are going to record the time that it occurred. We're going to record a description of it. So the color, uh, the consistency, and we're going to estimate the quantity or volume. Again, we can use one plus, two plus, or three plus. Uh, and then I have a few definitions here. We might want to record if the animal was really straining to defecate. We can use the term tenesmus. If we see that the animal has dark black tarry stool, the term is melina. If, uh, if the stool is really liquidy or really soft, that would be diarrhea, uh, especially if there's a lot of frequency involved as well. And we want to record if there's any blood or mucus present in the urine or the feces. Um, when it comes to vomiting, it might not necessarily be vomit. It might be regurgitation. So the difference here is that regurgitation is passive. It's often very quiet and it's often associated with movement. So if the animal just ate and then you're picking them up and moving them around and then they bring up their food, it's likely regurgitation. Um, so in that case, it's going to kind of look like, uh, you know, like food that was just swallowed. <laughs> Uh, vomiting, vomiting tends to be very active. You know it if an animal is vomiting, they're making noise about it and it tends to be projectile. It's being forced up. And then the last thing that we want to monitor in our patients is we do want to monitor them for signs of pain. Uh, so there are some, um, you know, people or facilities that recommend that we do uh, assess pain as the fifth vital sign. Uh, so some of the things that we might see if an animal is in pain, because they're not going to tell us they can't, they're going to show signs. So we might see changes in their behavior. A usually happy-go-lucky dog is all of a sudden really down and sad. That can indicate they're in pain. If they're protecting the affected area, so holding a paw up and close to them might indicate that that paw is sore, or if they're like guarding their belly after ab abdominal surgery. They might be vocalizing, so calling out, crying, or whining. Uh, they might be licking, biting, or scratching at the affected area. They might seem restless and are pacing and don't want to sit down in their kennels. They might have tachycardia, so a faster heart rate, or hyperpnea or tachypnea, or an increased respiratory rate. They might display muscle tension as well. So for instance, if they have abdominal pain and you try to touch their belly, they tense up. And they might have hypertension, which is high blood pressure. So any of those things would count as signs of pain. If you do see signs that an animal is in pain, please ask the vet techs or the vet um, about it right away so that we can get some pain medication for that animal. No animal should have to sit and wait in pain for someone to notice them. So if you do see that there is an issue uh, and, a and an animal showing signs of pain, please bring it to the attention of the vet tech or the vet. And that concludes our lecture about patient monitoring. If you do have any questions about this content, do please reach out to your instructor. Um, other than that, thank you so much for listening and have a great day.